Hey yo, what is going down with my people, the Chico Army? But if you're new, you gotta earn your stripes. You're just a viewer of the tube. My name's Tyler, the host of the Crypto Channel that knows this fall is scary, but you gotta have fun with it, just like these monkeys. <laughs> You put that manky on that stick. When I dip, you dip, we dip. It's time for Chico Crypto. 12K resistance is proving to be a tough one as once that level was hit, immediate rejection and the slide began. As of yesterday, we were sitting just above 11,300, a 5.8% decrease. And you gotta know, this is where big money was made for those pesky leverage exchanges. From BitMEX data over the past two weeks, the free fall liquidated $60 million in longs, which is more than the shorts over two weeks combined. A single day, a single move net the exchange more money in 24 hours with long liquidations than two weeks with short liquidations. They set them up. Those who like to play that dangerous game of leverage. And I personally didn't think there would be that many dumb shats putting in longs in unknown price territory. But I get it now, how they got people to long BTC, whales with millions in unknown price territory. They were fueling the bullish narrative with DeFi. Although there was news that coincided with the dip this time. South Korea's largest exchange, BitThumb, was reportedly raided and seized by the police. Coindesk covered it and the raid happened apparently in connection with a $25 million token sale hosted on the platform for BitThumb tokens that never materialized. AKA BitThumb, they ran a shady IEO and the popo came in to figure out what was going on and get a hold of the downright illegal operations, not pull the plug and ban them outright. As lower in the article, it says exchange appeared to be active at press time. But this dip should have come earlier if this is the reason, as last week, August 26, the country's third largest exchange, CoinBit, was raided and seized over allegations of wash trading. And Korea isn't as much of a crypto haven dominance powerhouse as it once was. There are five big exchanges in Korea with volume worth talking about. Combined, they have about 1.8 billion in 24 hour volume spot trading volume. It's a smidgen of the world's actual trading volume. As we can see, total volume yesterday was over 100 billion. And the top exchange, Binance, had over 7 billion alone, four times that of all of South Korea. Shoot, Uniswap had over 1 billion yesterday, a decentralized exchange almost had more than any centralized Korean exchange and almost more than all their top ones combined. So this dip scare has a backing, but the backing has no weight. It's BS, kind of like the China FUD in 2017. Now, my personal opinion of what is going on, it has slightly changed since we last spoke of Bitcoin's movements. People within the DeFi space were making money over fist with high yield farming schemes and social media hype. This placed bullish sentiment in the markets and some of the whales who were making millions thought, hey, why not take some of that willy nilly profits and go long on BTC, the markets, they look ripe. And they did this even though the price of BTC was in unknown territory, which in the past has majority of the time went down. People went and gambled and they went long like dumb boys. So those in charge took it down like Charlie Brown and here's where my opinion slightly changes. I am going slightly bearish as it's time to set up the short dumb boys. Here's what I'm seeing. Pulling out the Bitcoin chart since last week, it was a slow and steady rise from under 11,200 to the 12K mark. This took place over the course of six days. Now pulling out the BitMEX liquidations, it wasn't anything to speak about. Short liquidations were spread out across that time period and look small in comparison to the long wrecked on September 1st. So they'll do the exact same thing with the shorts. We will slowly deflate and look like we will be hitting the CME gap at 9.6K. As with any downward movement in this range, it brings that right back into mainstream thought. But this time, the CME gap has a technical indicator to go along with it, the head and shoulders pattern. People are charting it like mad warning of the technical gods saying it must now be filled. So we're 
we're gonna see the suckers get suckered. Many will try to short BTC as the charts with this pattern are supposedly a shoe in and the whales in control are going to play into this in my opinion. I personally see 10.2K to 10.5K as the bottom and this will take place over the span of a week or so. Although Bitcoin is gonna Bitcoin as the whales play their games and while the whales play the Chico army prays. As there are opportunities abound in the crypto space which have everything to do with one thing, Ethereum. But every opportunity it comes from a problem. And the problem? Ethereum transaction fees are too gosh darn high. People thought the average fee was high in 2017, 2018. Well today it's ridiculous. It's not benefiting anyone except a certain sector of Ethereum's protocol. The miners. Total fees earned by the miners reach over 17 million 24 hours. Or you want to know how much that is per hour? 800 grand. So it's highly, highly profitable for the miners to keep things how they are for the time being. Ethereum as a proof of work protocol is making the mining farms bank money even more profitable than the Bitcoin miners. Checking out BitInfo charts and their mining profitability one, we can see it has never been this profitable to mine Ethereum with one mega hash of power. How about we try and add Bitcoin on the chart to compare? Well, it doesn't even show up. Ethereum is red, Bitcoin is blue because it's so low compared to Ethereum. Then Coindesk covered this topic August 12th in the article titled Daily Profitability for Ethereum Miners It's Over Two Year High. The article states the increasing profitability is a result of the recent price of the Ether cryptocurrency and a surge in transaction fees brought on by increasing levels of decentralized finance and DeFi activities on Ethereum. As a result, most of the Ethereum mining equipment is now able to operate with a profit margin above 90% even at an electricity cost of five cents per kilowatt hour. Who gets that five cent per kilowatt hour price or even lower? China does, which is seen in the mining pool breakdown for Ethereum. Four pools control over 50% of the hash rate. Sparkpool, Ethermine, F2 pool, and Zizu. Sparkpool, Chinese. Ethermine is from Bitfly, an Austrian company. F2 pool, Chinese. And Zizu, better known as Spider Pool, is Chinese. Now these pools are not using your regular old GPU. They're using specialized Ethereum-based ASICs, like the powerful InnoSilicon A10 models, and Bitmain's own lineup called the E3s, although the max mega hash is 500 per second. But things in the mining industry are going to get oh so interesting as a Lindsay E1400 gets ready to launch, or it already is. Back before this world craziness, Lindsay announced they had ordered the first set of wafers for this miner, announced all the way back in 2018. The power of this baby, 1400 mega hashes per second at a thousand watts of power. Now this is what Lindsay said about their testing. This will happen in our Shenzhen factory under our full control. Our factory test environment is currently set up for a maximum load of 80 kilowatts, which translates to 112 giga hashes. Now is that significant? Well, looking at Ethereum's hash rate, it's over 222 terahashes or 222,000 giga hashes. So it's not significant for Ethereum. But lower in their Medium article, the question was asked, will you do chip testing on a testnet? Of which they reply, we plan to do chip testing on the Ethereum Classic mainnet. Oh, as looking at the Ethereum Classic hash rate, it's 1.27 terahashes or 1,270 gigahashes. Thus, Lindsay's test alone would nearly have 10% of Ethereum Classic's hash rate. Now, these tests were supposed to begin in November of last year. We are almost one year away, and guess who has been getting hit by 51% attacks lately? The Ethereum Classic mainnet. Coindesk covered it on August 6. Ethereum Classic suffers second 51% attack in a week. And then in prior attacks to ETC, Lindsay has been blamed for those attacks. Cointelegraph covered one and said a tweet from the ETC Twitter handle, which has since been deleted, speculated that the testing of the new machine may have been a potential cause. So the point I'm trying to get across is not an Ethereum attack is coming, but there are industries and businesses who have dumped millions of dollars into this industry, the Ethereum mining one, and they are not going to let this type of profitability for themselves go away that easily. It's going to be the miners versus the DeFi users here soon. 
soon, but Ethereum has a light at the end of the tunnel with 2.0 and proof of stake. But there is a tunnel and a time where Ethereum will be in the dark. But that is where the opportunities will lie, the solutions that ease Ethereum's pain during this painful time and also push it forward, scaling, layer twos, and NFTs, which will be the topic of tomorrow's video. Don't miss it. Cheers, I'll see you next time.